hi everyone. My name is uh, Maarten Mulders. I uh, work at a Dutch company called InfoSupport, uh, mainly consulting there. Um, but as Johan said, today I want to talk with you about uh, transport layer security or uh, secure sockets layer as it used to be known. Uh, first, a practical thing. If you might have any questions, please uh, send them through the app. Uh, Johan will tell them uh, to me uh, at the end of the session. There will be some time and we'll discuss some of the questions. Uh, and also you can use the app to, uh, to rate the session. So, um, a quick raise of hands, please. Um, who has seen stack traces like these, so debugging problems somewhere on your machine or on your production server? Great, everyone. And so, what's your first reaction when you when you see this? <laughs> Face bomb. Okay, check. Call the security guy. Call the security guy. Great. Next time, maybe they'll call you for that. Um, because that's what, what, what I'm aiming at, to make you at least understand what's happening, how you can uh, troubleshoot issues like these, uh, and, and, well, have a basic understanding of the tools that you're using. So, um, but first of all, why should we actually bother about these materials? Um, we live in a world where we have more and more systems that communicate with each other, and more and more we require this communication to be secure. But on the other hand, it's very hard to do that correctly, to understand how it works and to implement it correctly. And if we have systems that communicate all over the world between various cloud providers, between on-premise systems, between mobile devices that, well, are in trains or hotels with, with non-secured Wi-Fi, I was glad to see that the Wi-Fi here is secured, but that's not at all conferences, you want to ensure that no one is listening to what you are uh, exchanging with other systems that you communicate with. So if you're familiar with the OSI model, the traditional model with seven layers, you see in the model there's an, uh, a presentation layer, and it says, well, here we do data representation and encryption. This means, if you, if you obey to this model, that uh, you're building an application and you're, con you're constructing some um, uh, some JSON, for example, and sending it back to a client. Oh, and by the way, I also need to write some code to encrypt it. But that's not the stuff that you want to build yourself. Now, what does transport layer security do? It basically says, we'll move it down there to the transport layer, and that's, that, hence the name, transport layer security. We're moving the security down to the transport layer so we can trust on the transport layer to be encrypted, um, uh, so we can uh, rely on that for our secure communications. So a brief history, because what is a presentation on any subject without a history uh, overview? Uh, SSL 1.0 was uh, officially never released. There were some beta releases, but it was so fundamentally broken that they never <laughs> decided to formally release it. Uh, they, in this sense, is Netscape, where the idea of a secure socket layer was originally conceived. Now, in 1995, SSL 2.0 came out, um, which was the first formally released version, and it was considered secure and stable for quite some time. But in 2011, the Poodle attack proved it to be very vulnerable and eff not eff efficient for use anymore. SSL 3.0 was uh, released in 1996. Um, the Poodle attack uh, was also proven to be effective for SSL 3.0 uh, a few years later, so you shouldn't be using that anymore either. And then TLS 1.0 came out. Now, the name is completely different because we're moving from secure socket layer to transport layer security. But in fact, the protocols are roughly the same. There's a few minor differences between SSL 3.0 and TLS 1.0. But well, it's just a different name, basically. But um, yet, it was proven uh, to be vulnerable to the beast attack in 2011. So you shouldn't be using that anymore either. So what can you use? You can use TLS 1.1. By now, it's, it's not yet proven to be broken. That's a fundamentally different thing than it's secure. No one has proved that it's broken. Uh, so you, you, you could use that. Same holds for TLS 1.2, which it was uh, uh, re released two years later. And just this summer, TLS 1.3 finally came out after almost 10 years of discussing the RFC, which is a pretty long time. And uh, we're seeing uh, more and more um, uh, websites, for example, um, migrating so that they also support TLS 1.3. Uh, but in general, TLS 1.2, I think, is the most widely used. Recently, Maven Central dropped TLS 1.1 support, if I'm 
correct, uh, if I remember correctly. That was quite a thing because there were several old build servers running old versions of Java which did not support TLS 1.2. Uh, and then there was quite a, quite a fuss about, well, how do, how do you migrate to this new Maven Central? Major difference between TLS 1.2 and 1.3 is that they dropped a few deprecated uh, 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 encryption ciphers um, which were considered to be too old to be practical uh, by now. Um, so, well, if, if you can, if you have the option to choose, uh, pick TLS 1.2 or 1.3, or depending on what your clients are. So, uh, before we dive in, um, I want to do a quick demo, fingers crossed always, um, just to illustrate what the issue is. Um, for that, I have set up a simple web server on my machine. Um, and I'm going to access the web server using CURL. CURL is a simple uh, command line HTTP client. And here I have um, Wireshark listening. Now what is Wireshark? It's a package capturer, and it will basically show every TCP package that is being transmitted over, the network over a given network interface on my machine. Since the web server lives on my machine, um, it will just look at the loopback interface, filter out a few TCP port numbers, and every package that goes through that port will be displayed here. So once again, see URL. Um, uh, what do we see here? Um, we see that the CURL tries to connect to localhost 9000. Uh, it get, gets back a simple HTTP response, lorem ipsum, while well, the rest of it you all know by heart, I assume. Um, but the interesting part is here in the package uh, sniffing. Because what do we see here? Uh, we see um, get HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 1.1, 200, OK, lorem ipsum, and the rest. So what, what does this show us? If we are somehow able to capture packages going to a machine or from a machine, we can effectively read along the communication. There is no encryption whatsoever. Now, lorem ipsum isn't the most exciting information to exchange, but if my bank uh, would offer me a bank environment online, which did not use HTTPS, but just HTTP, that would mean that anyone who is able to uh, capture those packages coming to my machine or leaving my machine would effectively be able to read my username and password. Well, that's something I would rather dislike. Luckily enough, we have laws that prevent banks from doing this, but well, you get the idea. This is what we're trying to solve with transport layer security, the fact that someone who, who has the required access can read along, um, in this case, with HTTP session. So, what does it take to prevent all of this? We basically need three things, and that's, that's also uh, roughly the, the, uh, the remainder of the talk. Uh, we need um, public-private key encryption, we need signed certificates, and we need something that's called a certificate authority. And at the end of the talk, there's also a quick section with some tips, tools, uh, which you can use for your own troubleshooting uh, if, if you run into these kinds of issues. So the first thing we, we need um, to have secure and reliable communications layer is public-private key encryption. Now, if you've ever read about this, um, you probably heard about RZ, which is a well-known implementation of, of this uh, kind of encryption. And that's very complex. People write PhD theses about it. It's, it's not your regular day-to-day -day work, at least not for me. There's a lot of mathematics involved. Um, and well, if I would try to explain that to you right now, I think we would need until tomorrow, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, that's not my plan and probably not yours either. So I've got a simpler version. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's a, a language that we all know and understand, at least I suppose that most of us recognize the kind of, of, of images. Um, what we see here is a, a safe. Uh, the safe is a lock. Um, but this is a very uh, specific one, because there's two keys that somehow interact with the lock. One key has a globe on it, which means it's a public key. Everyone around the globe is allowed to have a copy of this one. And it will open the safe the door of the safe in one direction. The other key there has my picture on it. Well, modeled, of course. It's, it's an abstraction. It's always an abstraction. Um, and I'm the only one who is allowed to use it. It's the private key. It's private to me. 
And it will um, also uh, open the safe, but in the other direction. And that's the relevant part here. Now, as I said, the public key is public, so each and every one of you can get a copy if you want. It's no problem. The other one, I'm keeping to myself. Now, how can we use this? Well, uh, what, what we basically do when we use public-private key encryption um, is that some, if, if someone of you wants to send me a letter, for example, a love letter, um, you put it in the safe, and you use the public key to lock the safe. Now, that means that the only one who can open the safe is me, because to open it, you need to turn the lock the other way around, and only my key can do that. Now you can put the, the safe on a truck or any kind of unreliable and unsecured transport layer. It's no problem. You can use pigeons or trucks or uh, well, whatever you wish, as long as it gets to me. And when it gets to me, I'm using my private key to turn the lock the other direction, and I can get the letter out of the safe, read it, and be happy. This is um, the simple version. Now, we can't do this without a little bit of math, so let's dive in. Um, because, obviously, that's not how computers work. What computers do when they apply RSA is basically this. They select two prime numbers, and we call them P and Q. Let's take P is 11 and Q is 17, both of them prime numbers, great. Next thing is we need to calculate the modulo of the two, so that's just multiplying them, which makes 187. Now we select a random number that lies between zero and the modulo that we just calculated. Well, let's just, for, for example, take a three, and we uh, put it in a variable e. And now I'm giving you a small mathematic equation. Could you please find me a d for which holds that d multiplied with the random number e minus one, modulo p minus one multiplied q minus one equals exactly zero. Well, if you're a quick reader, you can see that there's just one unknown, which is the d. So we can, by definition, solve this equation. Um, we can just fill in the, the things that we know. We don't know d, but we do know e. We know p and q. Um, so what we see is that um, we, we need to find a number modulo 100, 160, and it needs to be zero. Well, let's just make up uh, let, let, let's just do a guess. It's not the mathematic way to solve it, of course. Um, let, let's take, uh, for the left side, uh, let's take 320, which is divisible by 3. So that means that um, uh, if I need to subtract 1, I should be 321 minus 1 is 320. Modulo 160 is still 0. Uh, and I can solve for D is 107. Now, that's great. One thing to note here is that if um, E is a random number, um, I'm allowed to select any value there, as long as it's smaller than the modulo. Um, if, for example, I would say E is 75, I can do the same mathematic equation solving, and I would find D is 183. So there's a relation between the two. Now, what if we do not know P and Q? So we, have, uh, uh, we do know the product, product of the two, for example, 299. We do know the random number. Let's say it's five this time. Now, once again, there's the question, can you find me a D for which holds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> now, we have a lot more unknowns. We have three unknowns this time. It, it's pretty hard to solve this if you don't know P and Q. Um, on the other hand, as soon as we do know P and Q, well, it's more or less trivial again. Uh, it's, a, it's an equation with one unknown, and we could relatively easily solve that again. Now, the fun thing is, if you have a very big P and Q, the initial prime numbers, it will cost close to an eternity to find the, 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 the D value. And that's a very interesting property, because it means that we could distribute P multiplied with Q, we could also distribute the random number E, as long as we keep the original P and Q values to ourselves. Now, if you want to apply this, uh, this algorithm, let's say, for example, we want to encrypt the letter G. We have P times Q equals 187. We have E is 3, just as in the very first example. 
Um, and it, let's just say that the letter G is the seventh letter of the alphabet, so we have a code table which says G is seven. Now we co calculate seven to the power of E, which is seven to the power of three, which is 343. We do a modulo with 187, the product of P and Q, and we find the, the outcome is 156. Again, relatively easy mathematics here. This is something that your calculator might be able to perform, actually. If we want to decrypt this very secret message 156, we have access to the original values of P and Q. That means we can solve D, find that it's 107, as we saw before. Now we do a slightly different calculation. We take the encrypted message to the power of the value D that only we can derive, which is around 4 times 6 with 234 zeros behind it. It's a rather big number. And we, again, take the modulo 187 to find the number 7 as an outcome. Now, this is something that the calculator on your mobile phone will probably not do. If you type these numbers in, it will say, well, <laughs> that's way too big. The calculator on your Mac or on your Windows machine will not do it either. But it's, it's not complex for a processor. It's just that the user interfaces don't allow you to do it. But the processor can very easily do this. It's, 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 a, no, it's a breeze. And we find 7, and in our code table, we look up 7, and it's the letter G. So there we are, back with our, encrypt, uh, our original message. So this is, in a nutshell, how RSA works. And of course, it's way more complicated than this. But if you keep this in mind, there's a public key, there's a private key, and there's a relation between the two. The public key is distributed to everyone who wants to send me a message. You're pretty good to go there. Now, this is a fairy tale figure, and it's not fairy tale time yet. Um, now, what if two systems want to communicate with each other? Let's just have a very traditional client server example. Uh, communication obviously starts with the client uh, connecting to the server and saying, Well, hello, I want to communicate with you. And the server will res respond back and say, Hey, hello, nice to meet you. Oh, by the way, here's a certificate. And uh, we'll see in a few minutes what certificates are. Um, if the certificate does not yet contain enough information to exchange keys, there can optionally be a server key exchange after that, but that's depending on the cipher suites that you use and the key exchange algorithms that you use. And then the server will say, uh, okay, hello, done. Um, this is all that I've got for, for you right now. The client will respond with a client key exchange, exchange some cryptographic material again, and then number seven is a very interesting one. It will say, change cipher. From now on, everything that I'm going to send you is encrypted using the key material that we've just exchanged. And I'm, I'm finished by now. This is, this is all for me. The server will respond and say, well, OK, if you're going to encrypt stuff, so am I. So I'm chasing ciphers too. And now I'm done too. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the communication is set up correctly. Now, in this scenario, I'm acting as if it's just one public-private key pair. What they basically will do is they will calculate a shared pre-master secret, which is used for synchronous encryption, because it's even faster to calculate and to perform than public-private key, aka asynchronic encryption. But that's basically an implementation detail that you do not need to worry about. So once again, time for a short de demo, and we'll hopefully see that uh, all communication between uh, my client and my server is now encrypted. And even if you have access to the network uh, interface on the machine, you cannot read along. So what do we see here? Um, a lot of output once again. Uh, we see some uh, debugging output from CURLs. Uh, which indicates that we're using TLS uh, version 1.2, which is great. We see the messages uh, uh, according to the, the uh, protocol uh, being exchanged. And uh, we can inspect the certificate that the server used, uh, which is a self-signed certificate, uh, as uh, CURL tells me. Uh, but I told CURL, don't bother about that. And we'll get to that later. And once again, we see lorem ipsum and the rest down there. But now the good news is, that if we look again at our package sniffer, 
we see a lot of data being transmitted, but it's not readable anymore. That is, you can read it, you can read the numbers, but you can't interpret it anymore. So if one would be able to, to, to look at my network card or my machine, would not be able to read along the communication between the client and the server in this case. So, we looked at public-private key encryption, and in the process we came to hear about certificates. So the next thing we need to investigate is what are these certificates actually? Well, a certificate is basically a document, just like your driving license, for example, uh, which says that, that some entity is under the possession of some key material in this case. A certificate contains a lot of fields, uh, like, like a number, a subject, so in the case of a driver's license, the subject is me, uh, a validity, a usage, and <coughs> in this specific case, a public key. In the case of a driving license, obviously there's no public key in the certificate, but it says, well, he is allowed to drive uh, a, a car, but not a truck or a bus or a motor, uh, mo motorcycle. Uh, there's a fingerprint in it and the fingerprint algorithm, and that's basically it. Now, the thing is, as we already saw, you can easily generate a certificate yourself. If I would draw a, a, a pink piece of paper and say, this is my driving license because I created it, I don't think I'm getting very far with that approach. So there's also uh, something that needs to prove the authenticity of the certificate, in, in be it a driver's license or an, uh, an SSL certificate. Uh, and that's basically a signature um, and someone who says, this is my signature, I am here by certifying that this is all correct, what's in the document. Uh, and since we're talking uh, digital certificates, we need a, an algorithm to derive this signature. Now, how does that work? Once again, we can use public-private keys for that. What we see in this picture is that um, there's, what, there's a, a private key again, and there's a public key again. And it's distributed in the same way as before. So this person is the only one holding the private key, and all these persons down there, down there, um, have access to the public key. If I want to sign a document digitally, I put it in the safe. I'm closing the safe using my private key, the only one who can close it. So just take in mind, this is a different safe than the safe that we saw before. I'm closing the safe with my private key. I'm shipping it using truck, pigeon, whatever. And anyone receiving the message is able to open the safe. And by the fact that the safe is open, they can be sure that I was the one who closed the safe. Now, in the lower picture, there's an evil person. Uh, you can rec uh, recognize him by the, uh, the, uh, the eye uh, leap. Uh, and they're trying to put the document in the safe as well. They have a private key, too. So they're able to close the safe. Shipping the safe once again, and then somebody here wants to read the document, but the public key that he thinks belongs to this person doesn't open the safe. Why is that? Because it wasn't locked with the corresponding private key. So by the fact that the safe does not open in this simple version of the world, he can um, derive that the document is signed by somebody else than he thinks it is signed and that it should, as such, not be trusted. Now, in the digital world, it's a little bit different because I can actually read the document without uh, opening a safe whatsoever, um, and I can read the document uh, without verifying the signature. I could do that, it's stupid, but I could. Um, but let's just, for example, uh, uh, assume <laughs> that we uh, are always verifying these signatures. Now, what, this is also uh, explained using a little bit of mathematics. Uh, basically, a signature is a mathematical relationship between a message, a private key, and a public key. And this relationship actually has two properties, two functions, a signing function and a verifying function. The signing function is used by me. I'm uh, giving my private key, SK. I'm having, uh, giving a message, X. I'm applying the function to it, and it gives me a value, T. Now, if you want to verify the authenticity of the document, you invoke the verifying function using the public key, the value of t that I have calculated using the signing function, and the original message, and you get back either an accept or a reject, which tells you, yes, this document was indeed signed by Martin, or it was not. 
So if you uh, have a message and you have a public key and you have a signature, you can check whether they belong together. Now, this is all nice and good, uh, but who is going to sign these certificates for us? And that's where certificate authorities come into picture. A certificate authority is uh, an entity, usually a company, but not always. For example, Let's Encrypt is not a commercial company as far as I know, but they do sign digital certificates. And these entities certify the ownership of a public key, so that's the part of the key pair that each and every one of you can have. Um, the ownership by the subject of the certificate. So the certificate is issued to me, and it certifies that I own a, a certain public key. And it's my responsibility to be sure that I keep the private key to myself and that I don't lose it, for example. So what basically happens there is um, that these companies also trust each other and there's some kind of a delegate trust. You could say um, for, for a random person here in the room, I don't know who you are, obviously, um, but let's assume that I know a, a, a guy named John, and John knows somebody who's called Alice, and Alice happens to know you. Now, I don't only know John, I also trust him. Same holds between John and Alice, and same holds between Alice and you. And by, by the definition of the trust, I know that I can trust you, although I never met you. This sounds pretty good and pretty trustworthy, but the thing is, who is John in this first example? I do know a John, but that's probably not the John that, that we're referring to here. The thing is, um, in your web browser or in your operating system, the vendor of the browser or the operating system has defined who John is. Let's take a quick look there. This is uh, Mac OS, and what we see here, 169 Johns on my MacBook. I did not verify a single one of them, but Apple did. So what it basically says is John equals Apple. I trust Apple. I leave it to you if that's a good choice or not. Uh, you might be trusting Microsoft, same holds there. You're trusting uh, Google because you use Chrome, or you're trusting the Mozilla Foundation because you use Firefox. And they have this built-in list of Johns, certificate authorities. Now, the thing is, uh, we don't really need to worry about it because these certificate authorities, these are very serious parties. They have top-notch security procedures. And one of the most important security procedures that they have is the key ceremony. The key ceremony is a ceremony when they need to replace some parts of their key materials, their private keys, of course, because it's a good practice to rotate your keys every now and then so they have a, um, a book which describes how the procedure should be executed. It's typically a 180-page book. It's not really a page turner, I can tell you that. Um, and it will very detailed uh, give a description of how the procedure should be executed. And there's typically steps like uh, you need to invite uh, eight random people from the organization. You can't pick them up front, you pick them at the very day that you are going to run the ceremony. Uh, maybe even you need to invite uh, five people from the street that you don't even know. Why is that? Because they want to make sure that you are not going to infiltrate into the ceremony with people who are there witnessing and uh, confirming that the procedure is followed correctly. Uh, so th th there, must, there must be a few people who are definitely not henchmen. So, okay, great, we have random people with this big procedure, we have cameras all over in the room, eight or ten cameras is no exception. They will record the whole procedure, um, which is a very exciting movie of around eight hours with, with people sitting in the room, checking, checking, yeah, yeah, check. There's a logbook which also is, is signed by the notary and then everything has been according to plan or there was an exception to the plan, but well, we have altogether um, confirmed that it's okay to follow this exception. And then key materials have been replaced and the business can continue to run. But still, we have time for a little fairy tale now. This is the city of uh, Beverwijk. Uh, I told you I'm Dutch. Uh, Beverwijk is a city uh, a little north of Amsterdam. I've never been there, to be honest. 
so I'm not completely sure if you're missing out there. But once upon a time, there was a, um, a notary in, in Beverwijk, which was running a good business, and they thought, well, this whole digital certificate stuff, uh, we already do that with physical paper certificates. We could do that in a digital world as well. And they started to create digital certificates and sign them. They became a certificate authority. And they had a good life, and they, they run a good business, and they made quite, lo uh, qu quite good money on it, probably. Uh, but then on a, on a bad day, they were attacked. They were under attack by a hacker who was probably from Iran, but that was never officially confirmed. The attacker was able to compromise one of their web servers that hosted their website. The website was built using .NET Nuke software. I'm not saying .NET is bad, I'm just observing facts. It was built on .NET Nuke. Version 4.8.2.0 uh, was installed on a certain machine, uh, but there was a file, file upload vulnerability in this version of .NET Nuke. The attacker was able to use this vulnerability and enter the system. And the weak security of the Windows passwords on the machines probably gave this attacker the option, the possibility, to traverse through the network of the certificate authority. And on one of the machines that, it, uh, that he encountered, he found the domain administrator passwords, which made life a whole lot easier, obviously. So he continued his travel through the, uh, through the network infrastructure of DigiNotar, and finally uh, managed to obtain access to at least two of the certificate authority machines where the private keys lived. Take a short moment, what does this mean? What happened now? Anyone? Everyone was trusted. That's not what I was looking for, actually. Exactly. You can generate, the attacker was able to generate any certificate to any subject with any public key, and all major browsers and operating systems would consider the certificate to be trustworthy. That's not a good thing. Probably the attacker created some, some fake certificates for Google.com, but that's, that's not completely sure. Uh, what happened in the days thereafter was that Google blacklisted around 247 certificates in the Chromium browser, which were known to be issued by this certificate authority. Microsoft removed the DigiNotar root certificate from all supported Windows releases. Uh, Mozilla revoked uh, trust in the DigiNotar root certificate in all supported versions of uh, Firefox. And Apple issued a security update uh, to, to 11.005. Uh, but there's a, a small star there. And this is a moment where I'm not proud to be Dutch. This update of Microsoft Windows was withheld for the Netherlands for a few weeks on a request of the Dutch government because one of the customers of DigiNotar was the state of the Netherlands. And all web applications within the state government were secured using certificates issued by DigiNotar, directly or indirectly. It's a bit as if you come home at a bad day and you find that someone broke into your house. Someone found the key that was laying under the doormat. And instead of directly replacing your keys all in your house, you say, well, no, no, no. Tomorrow the house cleaner will come and she needs to be able to get into the house. So I'm just leaving it as is. And we'll replace it in a few weeks from now. That's what basically happened. And to make things worse, the responsible uh, government uh, representative uh, told the Dutch uh, public, no worries, no stress, no sweat, it's, it's all under control. There's just one thing you need to know. Um, there's this green check mark in the left of your address bar. If that's green, you're good to go. And that's the worst that he could have said, because you're not good to go. That's not what you need to check by now. So, as I said, this was not where I, this is not when I'm proud to be Dutch. But that's what happened. Finally, eventually, uh, the certificate revocation lists were being updated, and that's, that's, the, that's the, almost the best that, that was possible to do. A certificate revocation list is a list that is issued oops, uh, by a certificate authority, uh, and in this list they say, well, we issued some certificates in the past, but you shouldn't trust these anymore. What they basically had to do was list 
all certificates they ever issued there, but yeah, that's, that's, what, what, that's the proper solution to this problem. The thing is, um, since the attacker was still in the possession of the keys, uh, all of the above was also needed, because he could fake new certificates as if they were being issued by DigiNote. Um, it may, might not come as a surprise, but DigiNote eventually went bankrupt. So, once again, time for a little demo. Uh, what we have now is, uh, again, a small web server um, on my machine, but I've also told my machine that demo.google.com lives at my machine. And the port number is a bit unfor unfortunate, but yeah, that, let's just live with that. What it says is, welcome to Google. Of course, I'm not trying to connect to Google. I'm still connecting to my own machine. But what, what do we see there? Subject, so country, United States, state of California, location, Mountain View. If you're not paying attention, you might think, that, oh, well, this is, this is Google indeed. So what does this tell us? That still, even have, now we know all of this, trust is still a relative thing. If I make a typo, uh, and I'm not visiting uh, go to burr.com, but go to burr.com with an extra character in it, and someone issues a certificate which is valid because he owns a domain name, I'm not doing business with go to Berlin, but with some, some fake website. If you make a typo in the address bar when visiting your bank, and some attacker some, some, uh, uh, some attacker registered the domain, registered a valid certificate for it, and perfectly um, cloned the user interface of your bank, if you're not paying attention, you might think, oh, okay, I'm talking with my bank, so I can log in and I can do my financial business, which is not true. This is where uh, extended validation certificates come into the picture, because in an extended validation uh, certificate, there's extra information in the certificate, not only about the domain to whom the certificate was issued, but also to the legal entity that requested the certificate. So if I take, for example, a, uh, a Dutch bank, hmm. let's see, why is it not working? What we see there, is the extended validation information, which, which says, not only says the certificate is issued to ing.nl, okay, but if I make a typo, I can still get a certificate for that domain, but it also says, and the certificate is issued to a legal entity, which is checked at the Chamber of Commerce, which is called ING Bank NV in the Netherlands. And that's the party that I want to do business with if I have an account at this bank. So this extended validation certificates help you build an, uh, an extra layer of trust into the whole communication stuff. Disadvantage is that they are uh, relatively expensive, these certificates. But, well, they give more trust than a regular certificate does. So, as I promised you, there's also room for a little bit of tips and tricks. We saw uh, quite some tools already in use. The first tool that we've so seen is CURL. Um, the most important switches there are the V switch for verbose output and the K switch, which says, okay, the certificate might not be in my chain of trust, but I still want to continue the connection and the data exchange. If you want to make sure that a certificate is being uh, issued by a well-known certificate authority, just omit the K switch. And then you give the address that you want to connect to. If you want to troubleshoot trust issues, like why is the certificate not being trusted by my browser or by the software that I'm writing, you can use the OpenSSL toolkit. It has a S client command, which is socket client, I suppose. Um, it accepts a few additional switches, like show search and the server name. And I can give it a connect command, specify the address, the port number, and the server name there is for SNI purposes where multiple sites running multiple domains run on one web server. The web server somehow needs to know which domain you're trying to connect to. Um, and it can't wait for the HTTP data to come in because we're trying to build a secure connection here. So we haven't exchanged any protocol data there yet. Um, if you want to troubleshoot about uh, protocols or ciphers not being accepted either by the server or by the client, you can use the Nmap tool. Uh, which has a built-in script called SSL enum ciphers. Um, you give the port number and an address, 
and it will just spit out all the, uh, uh, the, the ciphers, compression suites, et cetera, et cetera, that the server is willing to, uh, to use uh, when communicating with you. So if you're building software for the JVM, um, you might be wondering how do I apply all this to my Java or Scala or whatever based software. If you start a JVM, you can supply JVM switches, and there is a, quite a couple of them that relate to uh, transport layer security. We have the Javax Net SSL Trust Store uh, system setting, which should point, which should be the path to a file, which is called the Trust Store. The trust store is just a file on disk which contains all the certificates that you, as a uh, systems operator or developer, are willing to trust when building this connection. Now, this file can be encrypted, um, and if it is encrypted, you need to supply a trust store password too, which is the, the password to unlock the file. The default uh, trust store that comes with the JVM um, contains around 160 uh, certificate authorities, just as the many operating systems and web browsers do. And that password, that it's also protected with a password, which has the very suggestive name of change it. It might be a hint. Um, in the same manner, we have two properties for a key store. A key store is also a file on disk that may contain public and or private keys. Now, the format of a trust store and a key store is identical, so you could theoretically have one file that is both a trust store and a key store. Whether this is acceptable depends on how secure you want to operate your system and, and how, uh, how sensitive the key materials are. You could do it, but sometimes systems operators are more like, no, 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 let's separate the two because this is the very sensitive materials, the private keys are there, uh, and, and we need to, uh, to keep that secure uh, uh, as much as we can. Also, this file can be password protected uh, with a password, for example, change it. This is a very uh, useful one if you're still running into trouble and OpenSSL and CURL say everything is okay, but still your Java-based program says it's not okay. You can supply a switch which is Javax Net Debug, uh, and if you put it uh, on SSL, yeah, it's still SSL because it's rather old, it will give you a lot of debugging information about the TLS handshake and the encryption decryption, uh, all the stuff that's related to this uh, secure transport layer. You could filter it using uh, some flags, which will uh, allow you to filter out specific parts of the debugging information. If you omit the flag, it will just spit out each and everything, which is a lot, really a lot. So it might help to, to, to filter because you're usually looking for a specific type of problem. Finally, if you want to work with uh, key stores and trust stores, uh, the JDK comes with the key tool, which is a uh, command line tool, which is not really very easy in use, at least that's my, uh, my personal opinion. So I prefer a graphical user interface where I can just point and click at certificates, inspect them, generate new key pairs, export them, uh, do certificate signing requests, etc., etc., um, And it will just allow uh, all, all major key store formats to be uh, used. 